Thank you very much. This is all quite serious. You've just had a massive orthopedic talk. I feel a lot of pressure. Angela, I used to work with Angela actually under a spiritually. There's a couple of faces here who've been under her wings. Uh, she's very, very capable, so this is a tough act to follow. Uh, but most of tonight should be quite relaxed. I don't, finals, I remember, has always been this massive high pressure thing where everyone was like, oh, I went to 19 out of the 24 countdown to finals, oh, I covered 17. And it becomes this kind of game about how much you've revised, how much you've learned, how many points you've scored, how many MCQs you've done. At the end of it, all of us have come out the same way, we're doing the same jobs and learning the same amount and making the same mistakes. So just take a deep breath. It's a very easy topic. Neurology is probably the one that you need to think about the least. If you haven't wrote learned, I promise you, don't, don't raise your eyebrows at me. It's the one that you can actually work out in the exam even if you haven't learned it. I promise you, and we'll go through it. You'll know most of it at this stage already. It's now just about nerves, that's all it is. So let's go through it. If at any point there are questions, shoot them out. You don't need to wait till the end. If there are any uh, that you want to discuss at the end, keep a tab. Uh, there's also my email, so uh, none of this is kind of hard and fast that it can only be done today. It can be done any time. So, uh, talk on neurology. Uh, written a uh, massive topic, but not something to be daunted by. You'll get a, a pretty good talk on OSCEs as well afterwards, if you haven't had it already, and that'll kind of cover the practical aspects. I'm covering some of the arguably boring and more tedious stuff in that you have to remember catchphrases to be able to recognize things in exams. Now you'll, by this stage, you'll already be at a point where you would have known those catchphrases and you'll say, you know, thunderclap, headache, boom, and we'll go through what those catchphrases are and what they would signify in terms of uh, the pathognomonic signs. Uh, what, what do we want to get out of today? Well, you need to know enough neurology to be able to pass your exams. That's one thing. But you probably that would be more than enough for what you'd need in your first year anyway. You, because what you need to pass exams is partly what you need to be a red in a clinic. And you don't need that much as an FY1. You're not going to see the uh, shy Drager syndrome in a ward clinic patient. You know, you, all you're going to see is someone with a low GCS that the nurse has leaped you about and said, I don't know what's going on, can you come review the patient? And you say whether it's a stroke, whether they haven't just had their breakfast, what it is it? That's probably more what you're going to see. Uh, but we're going to go through just a couple of revision tips because it's love for the subject is, is very much appreciated, but I think your time is precious and you want to know how you can get maximum out of a revision session. Uh, key things that we've looked through your syllabus for that you might need uh, to pass this year. A couple of sample MCQs that we can go through and that can be as cases, so you revise while you run questions yourself. At the end of this talk, you need to go home relaxed, feeling good about the paper, and to know if you have any other questions whom to ask. Okay, uh, so a couple of ways to revise neurology in general, and this is not just neurology, this is cardio, renal, surgery, anything that you have as finalists. Finalists, uh, the examiners really love structure, whether it's in your thinking when you're approaching written questions, or especially when you're presenting in an OSCE situation. So structure your revision as well, why not? There's two ways. One, you can do it by etiology, and the bright ones have already seen the yellow first uh, capital letters which scores your surgical sieve. I use vitamin D, you can have any of those, I think, Windicage, you can make any acronym you like if you spend enough time on countdown. Um, but you want to try and say which common conditions will you get. So of your important ones, you've got vascular, all the bleeds, the strokes, the hemorrhages, both intradural, extradural. Where is it? Infections, meningitis. Is it in the meninges itself versus whether there's any uh, epidural abscesses in the spine, uh, your trauma, um, metabolic things uh, like encephalopathy, just having a low GCS because of hypoglycemia, uh, hypo or hypernatremia, all of these things. Of those, there are certain ones that you will really need to know and some that are linked to everything. So for example, if you see at the bottom the neuropathies, they start because they could be because of infection, and if you imagine mononeuritis multiplex, you can have it because of syphilis, you can have it because of metabolic reasons, because of diabetes. Uh, so there'd be certain things that would seep into all of all the others. Uh, neoplastic, paraneoplastic syndromes will give you that. So that's one way. Another way, a uh, shorter list, but potentially you've got bigger webs. If you imagine uh, those who are keen on spider webs and multicolored pens, uh, 
uh, if you go by symptoms, then you say, well, pain, what will give you that? Well, trauma will give you pain. Hemorrhage will give you pain. Um, infection will give you pain, depending on where it is and what nerve fibers it's stimulating. Same with weakness, same with gait problems. So you'll see Parkinson's would have a different gait to a cerebellar gait. It would be different to a Trendelenburg gait. You just had a talk on orthopedics. You have the adductors and the abductors, the weak hip abductors on the contralateral side that gives you the Trendelenburg gait. So that waddling you get. All of these are giving you different gates. Antalgic gait. What's an antalgic gait? Painful gait. Exactly. You've got a stone somewhere in your right shoe stuck in and you're hopping on that knee with a shorter stance phase so your sphinx phase is quicker but your stance phase is smaller. All of these things sound a bit more jargony but it's nice points if you can say it to an orthopedic examiner in the exam rather than just saying, well, I hop on that leg. You can actually say, well, the gait is divided into two primary phases with... Uh, a um, heel strike and toe lift in between. And amongst those, it's the stance phase that's redu reduced in the intelligent gate. Very simple answer. Doesn't need any fancy thinking, but it's how you present that's going to get you the marks. Okay. Neurology, honestly, you need only two things. Where is the lesion? So where have you hurt yourself and what is it? You think that and you're good to go a long, long way. The other thing is that Despite the fact that the impression is that you can get lots of specialist investigations and you can get electromyography, you can get nerve conduction studies, you can get EEG, you can get um, lumbar punctures uh, for specialist serum fluids and uh, viral PCR. All of this has come on very s recently in the history of neurology. Most of it is history and exam. You know your history and exam, you'll cover most of the diagnosis by far compared to other specialties. MI, you can't really tell. Uh, you've got a pretty good clinical picture with the central chest pain, but until you've got that ST elevation on an ECG, neurology, it's pretty simple, actually. If you really want to push the boat out, the other thing you can do is chase the duration of your symptoms, and that tells you a lot, lot about your pathology. So something that happens right now, me stopping speaking in this lecture theater right now, only a couple of things can really give me that. Either I've blew my head with a bleed inside, or someone's chucked a cricket ball at my head, and I've had trauma. There's very few things that'll make me go down within mi seconds to minutes, or I'm having an absent sheezer and I suddenly start shaking. If it's gone on hours or days, so let's say I've had some pain in my head for the last couple of days, getting progressively more nauseous, sicker, uh, having some neck pain in the last few hours, that's more infection. You're thinking inflammation somewhere because you're giving that time for the pathophysiology. You're giving that time for the macrophages to come in. You're giving that time for the mast cells to Im in, uh, imbibe that space. Uh, weeks to months, that's more your cancer. So you've given time for the cells to grow. You've given time for them to uh, become undifferentiated so that they can grow pluripotently. And that's leading you to the now symptoms from either obstruction um, depending, and we'll talk about space occupying lesions later, uh, or more systemic symptoms like, for example, weight loss, um, reduced appetite, like with any uh, malignant syndrome in anywhere in the body. Months to ears, that's more your degeneration. Doctor, my back's hurting, that's more your wear and tear of the spine. Um, it's more congenital, things like that, that's taking you ears, so cerebral palsy, things like that. So, what will we talk about today? Uh, things in yellow are things that were major, I think, act conditions in your syllabus. The other things were, I think, list one. So they were important, but you don't need to uh, be an expert in them, but you do need to probably know them for the MCQs, and sometimes you will get them. Um, there's A, we won't be able to cover everything, but B, more importantly, you'll know most of the rote learning already. So the aim for the revision lecture shouldn't be giving you a list of things that you can get on the internet anyway. What we're going to try and do is work through some of the questions, think how you're going to approach a question when you're faced with an MCQ and nothing else but a biro or a HP pencil with your site, and then say, okay, how do you go about splitting things down? The ones who I, my friends, who did the best were, I think, ones who didn't go with any anticipation in the exam. So if you go with a blank mind and you don't think you know the question and what it's asking of you, then it's easier because you can work through and whatever your first hinge is, you pick that and then you play your cards and see how it goes. Okay, so, uh, first one, bleeds. Stroke, there's a little bit of confusion, so this is just a big um, 
flowchart just to say how we split them. And you've had, I understand you've had a very nice talk by Sufian already about TIAs and strokes. Is that right? You've had a decent lecture about that. Yeah? Nods? No? Yes? No? Perfect. So we're not going to go into any detail whatsoever about strokes in general because A, your knowledge will be pretty good and B, you understand the concept that it's anything to do with acute neurology for a vascular cause until proven otherwise on a time scale of 24 or more hours. Big split, ischemic, hemorrhagic, people say 85, 15, 80, 20, uh, whatever number you like, essentially ischemic much bigger. Of the hemorrhagic, you can split them into intra and extra-axial. So intra-axial, things like your ventricular bleeds, what neonates get, what babies get inside their ventricles, or intraparenchymal bleeds, bleeds that are actually in the cerebrum, in the brain tissue. All the hemorrhages that you hear about are what we call extra-axial. So if you go through your brain from outside to inside, these are your extra-dural, your subdural hematoma, and then your subarachnoid hemorrhage. And all your classical symptoms and cases and MCQs you will get is of these extra-axial bleeds. Those three are what we're going to go through today. With all of them, you'll have a picture in your mind that I want you to take home with so that you don't have to faff around. You can attach an image to what the case was and you remember that classic symptom and diagnosis. So, it's an Aussie playing an Aussie, but that looks like a pretty good hemorrhage about to come out if that guy gets hit in the head with that cricket ball without a helmet. You've got a 29-year-old playing cricket, golf, pick whatever high-impact sport you want, baseball, whatever you like, uh, boxing. So he gets injured to the head, he loses consciousness, there's a lucid interval where he's fine, he starts talking to you, says, no, no, I'm all right, let's play on, and then he drops. His GCS becomes five, you blue light him into ambulance, he comes to A&E, and he's blown his pupil. What do you think this scan shows? extra dual hematoma and you've got it at the tip of your tongue so it's a CT who can describe the shape just you know the classical term so just let me know what the shape is for the extra dual convex exactly and biconvex isn't it both sides are out so what we call a lentiform exactly lens shape someone said so lentiform shape biconvexity uh, and a bright bleed so br this is acute bleed on a CT so that's your shape that's the outside bit going in, so you've got a convexity there. Okay, compare that to this. That's a subdual hematoma <coughs> waiting to happen, okay? And why is that? You've got the classical signs in the picture, so it's, what's the age of the patient? Old, young, old. Uh, she likes to have a good time. She uh, has uh, more than the necessary amount of alcohol in a given week. So both of these things will give you cerebral atrophy, both age and alcohol intake. Where does your subdual hematoma come from? What's bleeding? Veins, exactly. So it's a low pressure bleed. So it's building over time. Exodural, what's the classical bleed? What's bleeding? Has it a guess? Artery? Classically, which one do you know? Depending where you get hit, it'll be different ones. But if it's side of the head, the classical picture is middle meningeal. There you go. You've got it on the tip of the tongue. So that'll be your arterial bleed. Bam, high pressure system. Subdual. Slowly, it's the veins, what we call the bridging veins. As the brain shrinks and comes down and down, you've got bigger and bigger distance and th thinner and thinner things to hold the two tissues together. The veins are under tension. Give them a little bit of a low impact trauma, like a fall. Um, Nan fell over a couple of weeks ago, now she's confused. She started having weakness in her legs, but we thought it was just her age and she wasn't moving around that much last week. Now she's not being able to recognize her grandkids and finding it difficult to say uh, everyone's name in the house. This is your subdual. It's become, it evolved from acute to subacute to chronic. 89 year old, falls over, headache, new confusion, worse uh, weakness over a few days. That's your subdual. So again, you've got a picture to your mind. And this is a concave uh, picture. So there you see, instead of a convexity, you've got a concave image. And that's your classical CT sign. So I don't know if you get scans, if you might get images, but you know how to describe them anyway pretty well. The other thing that they'll always ask you is about midline shifts. And I know Supian went through this as well. Um, so if you're referring ever to a neurosurgeon, the things you want to see is, if, is there mass effect. 
because that tells them how what the volume of the bleed is because they will try depending on the ct measure it in three dimensions so you say x millimeter by x millimeter y millimeter by z millimeter and that tells you how the volume of the bleed and how much it's causing an effect and pressure on the other side of the brain there's a degree of midline shift here and it's pretty chunky that bleed so you want to try and evacuate it as much as you can to try and resolve their neurology so this is your diagram of your brain. You've got the bone outside, dura just underneath. Between the two is your extradural. Next level, between the dura and the arachnoid is your subdural. Next level, arachnoid and pia, you've got your subarachnoid, and that's your three bleeds. As long as you've got that clear in your head. It's pretty simple then, because you've got the anatomy in your head. So when that bleed comes, you know where it's coming from, what the picture is going to be, and what your action needs to be. Watch this. So. Doctor, it's the worst headache of my life. Thunderclap. My uncle had uh, cysts in his kidneys. You've got every recipe in there to make a diagnosis. Yeah, subarachnoid hemorrhage is there. It's front-loaded. There's so many clues in that already. So you've got a link, a, a familiar link with other syndromes as well, but polycystic kidney disease, for example. So you know, for instance, that you will get what we call berry aneurysms, that those little blue arrows are pointing to what circulation? Circular villus, exactly. So, a berry aneurysm, small, tiny shape, somewhere in the circular villus, pops, especially hypertensive bleeds, can happen in subarachnoid space, as well as intraparenchymal space. That's what this is showing you. Worst headache, uh, sky high blood pressure, and this is again someone who needs urgent neurosurgical referral, plus or minus evacuation. So what do you do for these guys? You can give them medical treatment. Uh, some uh, surgeons would say there's only four real drugs you need to know in neurosurgery. One of them is steroids to calm down any inflammation or edema, because all of these bleeds will have edema around it. Another is that you want to turn down their blood pressure so that they don't get increasing bleeds. But at the same time, it's a bit of catch-22, because you want to keep up what you call the cerebral perfusion pressure. If you remember way back in first or second year, you would have had cerebral autoregulation, where the brain works its own blood pressure out in terms of what its surrounding tissues are doing and what the metabolites are generating. To maintain that, you initially want to keep the systolic above about 160 to make sure the brain veil perfused. But you also want to give them something called nimodipine, especially if it's subarachnoid hemorrhage, calcium channel blocker, to try and reduce the risk of what we call vasospasm. This happens about seven or eight days after a subarachnoid hemorrhage, where your arteries suddenly go into spasm and you get worsening neurology after um, a little bit of improvement. If you're an ITU patient, you slowly start to see needing less vasopressors, starting to get a better neurological exam, and then they go downhill again. What else do you need? Well, you've got a bleed somewhere in your brain, and your neurons are not going to like it, so they're going to start spasming, and they're going to go into seizures, that's seizing. So you want to give them something to calm them down, so you want to start them on anti-epileptics. And the other thing is that you want to try and, again, give a, uh, what do you call an osmotic di diuretic. Manitol is nothing fancy, excuse me, it's just like glucose or any other um, osmolite that has a higher molecular weight, so that it sucks fluid out of other tissues. This is your medical treatment. What do you want to do if you are someone who can have a scalpel and open the patient's skull? Well, you want to either try and do a bar hole, you just want to drill a hole and try and evacuate depending on what the size of the bleed is. Or you want to do what you'd call a craniotomy. So just open versus a craniectomy, take out uh, the skull itself. And you try and then evacuate the bleed depending on the size and the neurology of the patient accordingly. Other thing you can do is if there's either bleed into the ventricles or if there's what you call hydrocephalus, so pressure within the ventricular system, you can put a drain in there as well. It's a fancy word, ventriculostomy, but it's the same as any other stoma. So it's the same as a drain in your pleural space. It's the same as a chest drain. It's the same as a pericardiocentesis. It's the same as an acidic drain. There's fluid, there's pressure somewhere, you need to drain it. The same concept, there's fluids in the cerebral ventricles. You put a drain, you drain it out. The patient's neurology improves. Now, some of this you're not going to be the first person to do a lot of it, you're not going to be the first person to do. So all of this fancy stuff, you will only, of course, do after you do your basics. Like Andrew was saying earlier, A, B, C, D, E, always airway first, then breathing. 
if that doesn't work, then there's no point going to circulation because he's going to die of that earlier. So cover those in order. Do their urgent bloods, including clotting, group and save if you think they're going to go for theatre. Get their blood sugars checked in case that's a any derangement and that's why they're having low GCS. Get an ECG so that the anaesthetist can see if they're going to theatre. Get some neuro obs regularly and ask the nurses to keep a close eye and have your bleep ready. It's your bleeds. They're simple. It's just when you have one in front of you, you will crap yourself. That's fine. You can carry on. And just like that, if you have a system in your head that will take you through most of the conditions and acute emergencies you'll have. The reason you can think why your uh, syllabus examiners would have written this up as well, those that are act conditions, they're usually either emergencies or something that you would be bread and butter in your first year of medical training. So that's why they'd probably keep those as the important ones. And it's the same with this one. So I'll give you a second to just read the case. So you're working in the A&E, you're on call and there's a patient who's come in with about 12 hours of headache. He says his neck is a bit stiff, he can't push it all the way back. You shine a pen torch in his eye to see his pupils and he doesn't like that. His ops show that his BP is fairly high and you do a lumbar puncture after checking that he doesn't have a raised intracranial pressure so that you don't cone him <laughs> and it report comes back as xanthrochromia. Who will fancy is shouting out a diagnosis? Yeah, subarachnoid hemorrhage, exactly. But why is that so similar then? So what's the difference? That's 12 hours history of headache and neck stiffness. That's there in other conditions as well. Unable to tolerate a pen torch, photophobia, that's present elsewhere. What's giving you the hemorrhage? It's the high blood pressure and the xanthrochromia, isn't it? What's the xanthrochromia? Yeah, exactly. So that you wouldn't get in anything else and you've got subarachnoid hemorrhage there. If that's a bleed, then what is meningitis? Well, meningism would be there in other conditions as well. So out of this list, this is, I think, an awareness poster. And if you see the headache, the stiff neck, vomiting, that'll be there in, other, in either the hemorrhage or the meningitis. Confusion will be there as well. Drowsy can be there. What you won't have is usually fever. You might get one in subarachnoid hemorrhage, but not a swinging pyrexia, for example, that you might get with a fulminant meningitis or a, especially an encephalitis or an abscess. You won't get that. You won't get the myalgia typically that you might have with a prodrome that's more infectious than subarachnoid hemorrhage. You'll also have a different clinical onset, so you wouldn't have an instantaneous. It wouldn't be, bam, today afternoon, I suddenly went from zero to 100 in terms of my head. That wouldn't be there. Meningitis, you'll have two things. You'll see from an infection point of view, but also from a sepsis point of view. So you'll need to treat the infection, but also resuscitate the patient. You may have positive neurology, so you'll have a low conscious level. You'll have seizures, because again, the meninges are inflamed, brain tissue sitting just underneath. You may have focal neuropathies, depending on where the focus is. But you're also, you may or may not have sepsis, and this is where you talk about meningitis versus meningococcal sepsis. So you'll have fever, you'll have tachycardia, you've got two there already, you know already your SIRS from your sepsis from your septic shock, right? So you're going down the list and the patient's getting worse and worse, you, they now have hypotensive, their capillary refill times enlarged, so again you're seeing that they're venodilating, they're not well perfused. They've got this classic purpuric rash, although not always, and you would be cautious to wait for it. It's like trying to do a chest x-ray in someone with a tension pneumothorax. You don't wait for the rash to emerge. You try and make your clinical diagnosis earlier if you can. Because what you don't want to do is send them into DIC. You get your platelets shot down, you'll have a much worse patient than you had when they came in. What are your classic organisms? So you've got your bacteria, you've got your Neisseria meningitidis, you've got your streptococcus. Then you've got the run in ones in the birth canal, so often babies when they're born in the birth canal, the mother has through vertical transmission some of these bacteria, your listeria, your haemophilus influenza, your group B strep, and this is why if you did, uh, I don't know when you guys did PEDS or ONG, but that's why you look out for all these infections as well, your torch screen at the same time, and of course you can have TB meningitis, tuberculosis meningitis. What's your treatment? So this patient comes to you and you're in the community, you're somewhere out 
uh, in the middle of nowhere in your GP practice, but you think you've got a pretty good shower. It's got meningitis. So you give them a shot of Ben Pen. You can give them penicillin in the community. And you can give them IM if you don't have a venous access. Once they come into hospital, you give them uh, keftrioxone. Uh, keflosporins of, of most kind, but keftrioxone is shown to have the highest penetrance uh, as a third generation keftrosporin. Plus or minus, if you think there's a viral cause, your CMVs, your EBVs, especially if someone's immunosuppressed, these are commensal um, viruses that will take advantage uh, and will make the patient much worse uh, if they already have uh, immunosuppression. And then you want to resuscitate at the same time, so push fluids, make sure they're well hydrated, um, make sure they're well perfused and warm. Okay, classic, uh, incredibly boring uh, MCQ question, but it's like a blood gas if someone fancies those. Uh, they're easy to do once you know them. So again, like an ABG, I think, I don't know how you guys do it and what's the best way you find, but I would always look at the pH first. You can tell because the person would never overcompensate. So when you say compensated X or Y, you would never shoot to the other side. So whatever your pH is telling you, the patient's either alkalotic or acidotic. Then you look at the CO2 and say whether it's respiratory or uh, metabolic, and then you see your bicarb. Same way with your CSF. If you pick either one, if you see this is bacterial, TB, or viral, if you pick either cells, that's a good starting point, because then it's like 20 questions. You can eliminate something immediately. If it's not neutrophils, then it's not bacterial. If it's largely lymphocytic picture on a CSF, all of this is obviously provisor with, there's never such thing as an always, but the concept is that this is what you're going to get in MCQs. There's no trick questions there that are meant to be there. So if you've got someone with a lymphocytic picture, it's automatically TB or viral. Then all you do is look at what their glucose levels are. And bacteria like glucose, they need food. So TB would have eaten up more of that. That's it. Your diagnosis is there. If it's not there and the glucose is greater than half of what plasma is, then it's viral. And you'll get the reference values in the exam, so it shouldn't cause you any trouble. Same way, another option is that you work backwards through glucose. So you say, well, what's got a low glucose? It'll only be the bacteria. So either TB or one of the non-mycobacterial ones. And then you again split into whether it's neutrophils or lymphocytes. Other things like subarachnoid hemorrhage, we'll have xanthrochromia, which we've already spoken about. Do not perform a lumbar puncture in certain patients. So like with any invasive procedure, don't stick a needle if they've got their clotting wrong or they, they don't have enough platelets in their body. You're just going to hemorrhage them out. You would not want to put a needle again in someone who's got uh, local infection at the LP site itself. So you'd ideally go beneath the L3, L4 vertebrae, somewhere along that line to miss uh, the spinal cord and go into your corticoina. That's where you'd inject your uh, lumbar puncture but you won't want to push it because you don't want to introduce the infection. You don't do it if someone's clinically unstable. If they're tachycardic, hypertensive, no point in bothering because you might as well make them worse. And you don't do it if they've got focal neurology with signs of raised intracranial pressure. All you do is drain fluid out and allow whatever's sitting at the top to just drop down. That's your brain herniating uh, down into your spinal cord and you definitely, no, no, don't want that. Not as common as it's made out to be. I should say that. So. The impression is that high intracranial pressure, put an LP, everyone herniates. That's not true. You can do not just a diagnostic, but a therapeutic LP as well. But I wouldn't be doing what I'd rather let the neurosurgeons or my neurology reg do it. Uh, right, from our point of view, other couple of infections. So meningitis you've done. Encephalitis, what's the difference? So you'll have a viral prodrome. Uh, you will have altered GCS, but you might have slightly subtler things, like you might have altered personality. They might say, oh, I went to Egypt last month, or oh, you know, I went to uh, Bahamas, or I went to the Nile and I got this tick bite, and then I thought there was nothing more of it. You might get a meteor history with some interesting elements. Um, you'll still have the meningeal symptoms as well. And there'll be common causes, so there'll be these viruses, your classic ones, herpes simplex, varicella zoster, the two immunosuppressive ones we already spoke about. Uh, Epstein-Barr, uh, CMV. Also have non-viral causes, so TB encephalitis, malaria, now we're getting into fancier things, Lyme disease. If someone saw scrubs, I don't know if you remember, bullet-shaped uh, tick bites, they finally shave the guy's head off and find it. Lyme disease essentially, borreliosis. 
what would you do to investigate encephalitis? Well, you'll do your standard things. So if someone's got a temperature and you think there's an infection somewhere, you'll certainly do blood cultures. But you'll also send up for viral serology to do a PCR. You'll also send up malaria films, so thick and thin. Tells you which type it is, falciparin versus other ones, Vivax, things like that, that you wouldn't need to worry about immediately. You'll also do a contrast CT, and this is slightly minor print, so ignore if you don't want to hear the next sentence, but some organisms will show focal involvement. It's really neither here nor there, and we're not going to be reviewing the films to say, oh yes, I can tell which bacteria it is from the seeing the CT contrast. But that's the other thing, uh, and you'll do your lumbar puncture um, if there's no contraindications, and you'll see that there's a high protein in lymph sites, so this is more a viral encephalitic picture. You can do an EEG which shows you basically uh, abnormality everywhere, but it's a bit non-specific. And you treat them with viral treatment, so you give them acyclovir basically, uh, and again antiepileptics. Abscess, the only difference is that you'll have something that tells you that there's a source for it to enter. So be it a history of, oh, I had an ear infection last week. I have recurrent sinusitis since I was a kid. I went to have a dental abscess removed just a couple of weeks ago. You'll have a source. You'll have somewhere that's allowing the abscess to track up and then forming inside. You'll be immunosuppressed. That's much more common. You'll get much more susceptibility. You might have had a skull fracture. And your organisms will be the ones that are mentioned there, typically your anaerobes that you want to worry about. Your bloods, you'll have a high ESR. Few things give you high ESR, but you know things like polymyalgia, rheumatica, things like that, you know, when you see a high ESR in an EMQ or an MCQ in an exam, you know, bam, I know the diagnosis. Parasitic conditions, another thing. They give you high eosinophilia as well. So there'll be certain blood tests that you'll know and automatically think, okay, I know what's going on here. Uh, CT or MRI, this is the other big difference in your imaging, that abscess will show ring enhancement peripherally with some edema. So that's what you will see in an abscess. And you treat them with cephalosporins again and urgently discuss with the neurosurgeons. They might need to take that abscess out. Abscess, again, like with anything else in your body, whether it's in your tummy, your chest, anywhere else, you've done enough medicine to know abscess doesn't heal by only antibiotics. If you're a surgeon looking after an abscess, you want to take it out one way or the other. And that's what you might have to do unless the patient's going to become worse if you stick a knife in. There's two of the big ones done. Uh, cancer. So, uh, this is another patient, and I'll take you through in a couple of minutes if you just want to take a read. This is actually a patient who's been admitted to our ward and discharged today. So sorry, that's the last thing I was doing just before coming here. He's a you're getting towards that age now where it's not the 40s, the 30s anymore, 63 year old man, so you're thinking there might be something else. Uh, nine month history of lower back pain, but nothing really specific. If you're a GP, you get 5,000 back pains a year. How do you know which one's the bad one and which one's not? 99.9% .9 it won't be the horrific one. But that back pain became worse in the last four weeks. He then developed right leg weakness when he came to our clinic. And he already had in that clinic a uh, couple of raised uh, blood markers. He came in with urinary retention as well, and you do a digital rectal exam because you're thorough and you want to make sure that there's nothing sinister going on, but you find that there's reduced perianal sensation, there's lack of tone. Here and now, tonight, which investigation do you want to get to manage your treatment? An MRI, absolutely, absolutely. The other things you <coughs> might do, one or the other way, in some point down the line, there are some that you just wouldn't do and are pointless in this clinical scenario but an MRI and you're suspecting. Yeah, absolutely, cord compression or cord equina. Uh, fancy words just to say where in the cord the compression is. So anywhere above it's cord compression. Conus medullaris is the bit that just hangs around the L1 region and then cord equina syndrome. All of these impression is the same. You're pressing this uh, lower end of the spine uh, somewhere to cause enough of a neurological deficit that might be irreversible. And there's two types people fit into complete and partial uh, cord equina syndrome. But from our point of view, uh, the dangerous things are always the same. They've got a deep back pain. They've got a stabbing, what you call radiculopathy. So it'll be a spinal root, a root that's coming out. You compress that, that's radiculopathy. Spine itself, that's a myelopathy. 
nerve, that's a neuropathy. So you have a radiculopathy kind of pain in a dermatomal distribution. So wherever the, the uh, nerve root existing is being compressed, that dermatome, you have pain shooting down. You may not necessarily have incontinence. You might have retention, actually. And that's probably the more common presentations. You might have urinary retention. And you have upper motor neuroscience below the level of the lesion. Where do you split your upper versus lower motor neuron? You can hear mumbling. You tell that in the anterior horn spell of the spine. So anterior horn cell, anything uh, distal to that lower motor neuron, anything further to that upper, so where you've got the, wherever you've got the lesion, around that you'll have lower motor neuron signs. Further down you'll have upper motor neuron signs. Picture showing exactly that. So uh, you've got L4, L5 on the left, slightly higher up, and L5, S1 compression slightly lower down. Um, causes, like with anything, your surgical sieve, so tumors, uh, bleeds, trauma, uh, prolapse, just degeneration, uh, any of those. You can get hematomas from uh, other things as well. So if someone's been post-op and they had an epidural, you take it out and then there was a vessel that the epidural had hit. It was tamponading it while it was inside, but you've taken the needle out. They get a hematoma and there's no coming back. You're paralyzed from that point down for the rest of your life. It's not something that you take lightly. Investigations, MRI, that will give you your definitive diagnosis. Uh, you want to find with a bone scan just where the primary was. So you do a full body nuclear medicine scan to try and find out where the cancer first was from. And then tonight, what you want to do if you're waiting for the scan till tomorrow morning or your seniors to come, is start on high dose steroids to try and uh, get that edema down, that swelling in that region. You start on 16 milligram dexamethasone immediately and you call the neurosurgeons there and there. They'll tell you with the picture and if there's anything else needing to be. Uh, tumors in the brain. We just have a one slide on this and we're going to talk very quickly. But it depends on the size and where it is that your symptoms will be. Mostly this is symptoms of what we call a space occupying lesion. So things like I get headaches first thing in the morning. And why do you have that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. You're lying flat at night, so A, you've got more venous return, and that's what's dilated. But you also breathe a bit worse at night. Your lungs aren't expanding as much. You get increased buildup of carbon dioxide in your cerebral perfusion. Carbon dioxide is venodilatory, so again, you dilate your uh, veins a bit more. And it's tiny factors, but this is what gives you pressure building up over the course of the night, so you get headache when you wake up in the morning. It's also a dependent headache, so you sneeze, you cough, you do valsalva, anything that raises your intra-abdominal pressure or any pressure that's transmitting further up, that gives you worse headache. And you get what you call false localizing signs. The reason for the sixth cranial nerve, I'm sure you all already know, is that it's got the longest course, which is why the first thing you might see is that they can't abduct their eye. But it's an illusion because the only reason is that there's a high uh, pressure. It's a limited compartment, that Monroe Kelly curve is showing you that on the right. You've got a limited space with only three things in it, brain, blood, and CSF. One expands, the other has to give way. There's no way the skull's going to expand to make room. And that's what you want to make sure. Until that point of decompensation, one of them will make room for the other. Once that stops, you've got no way coming back. And your causes, as ever, are the same. Your surgical say, always thinking of the same things. You think of cancer, you're thinking of vascular, you think of infection, trauma. Same thing for all of these. Treatment, you just take it out if you can. If you can't, and if it's in an eloquent area, then it becomes much harder. And depending on your pathophysiology, a meningioma may come out, a glioblastoma, what we call grade four gliomas, your prognosis is pretty poor, regardless of whatever treatment you have. Fine. Lastly, compare a space-occupying lesion with just benign intracranial hypertension. Who knows the description for the... Uh, classical patient who gets gallstones. Four Fs. Do you remember that? Yeah, pretty close to the patient who gets benign intracranial hypertension, actually. You'll get young women who have a slightly high BMI, uh, and they will get these headaches, and they're similar to what you might think suspicious um, looking symptoms. They get headaches in the morning, um, nausea and vomiting, but they're benign intracranial hypertension, and it's hard to tell the difference until you do further imaging. Right, uh, whistle stop. 
take a breath. Next one, uh, we go through a couple of cases of degeneration. So this is your other big topic. Main ones are things like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis. You know these already because they'll be the common ones. You might see a patient with them. There are EV signs to get. They're stable patients, so they bring them in OSCEs as well. And you can nail them because you already know the clinical diagnosis and the history and everything about their treatment. This is kind of your bread and butter stuff, so I would say this is what you want to spend time on. Uh, what's the problem? You've got no dopamine uh, neurons in your basal ganglia, especially substantia nigra. Uh, so what happens is that you, f you don't fail to make movements, but you fail to start them or stop them. So if you imagine like you're a first-time learner driver, you stall much more when you start. Then you're fine driving and changing gear if you reach that stage, but then you stall again when you're trying to make a decent break. That's what these patients feel like, because they're going to struggle. You see the elderly granddad with a stick at the traffic light, but he won't be able to cross the road. He's just stuck there, because the initiation doesn't happen. Your classical motor components, you say three or four things depending on who you ask. Tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, postural instability. You know these by heart now. The one I would say is probably the most sensitive from what uh, seniors have told us and what the neurologists have said is probably the bradykinesia. That's the one that actually tells you the most about how the patient is doing, whether this is a subtle early Parkinson's. But there's also now more and more work into going, saying there's a cognitive element. So it's not just the motor symptoms. These patients are very prone to getting depression. They're prone to not bearing pain. Uh, they're prone to sleep and memory disturbance. They're not going to have uh, an easy time remembering things. And they'll have things like micrographia. So if you ask them to write a sentence, their handwriting will get smaller and smaller. This is bradykinesia, but just in a different format. The movements are getting smaller and smaller. You also have a monotonous voice because you've lost the uh, ups and downs, the cadence of normal speech. And it's the same reason why you've got reduced facial expressions. Uh, what you do is a photon emission CT uh, with a fancy isotope and you try and assess their day-to-day -day life with what you call a unified Parkinson's uh, disease rating scale. That's the new scale now that you can use and what the rehab neuroconsultants would love. Uh, you don't need to know about the fancy isotope scan for day-to-day -day bread and butter. You need to know how to say whether the patient can do, you know, can they cook their meals? Does someone come to do their washing and cleaning? That's your Parkinson's disease rating. Uh, management, you want as many people to help you as you can with anything that's degenerative. You want lots of input, so you want your physios, your occupational therapist, your spine specialist, if they've got any extension that's causing them because they're all often stooped and they often have postural damage. Um, you want obviously your neurologist specializing in rehab and, and degeneration. And the treatments, you know these by heart. If you don't, worth just uh, night before skimming through a couple of them. They're standard, they're the same things, and if you think why you're giving them, the problem is that you've got a degeneration of your dopaminergic neurons. So the easiest one you can give is something to boost that, and you give ant uh, uh, agonists for that, or pinarol, the old school ones, amantadine, things like that. Um, levodopa, but the dopaminergic neurons are elsewhere as well, so you want to calm them down to give carbidopa with it. And then you can do surgery, so there is now lots of interest in deep lane stimulation, things like that. Just put an electrode in the basal ganglia. That should take care of it. Parkinson's disease is one. Parkinson plus syndromes is a cluster of syndromes. And there's four main types that you would need to know only by the first name and their characteristic things. So what you call multi-system atrophy would have Parkinsonian symptoms, but also they would have their postural blood pressure drop. They would have autonomic disturbance. Uh, so their blood pressure won't stay still. And they would have cerebellar signs. They would have your ataxia, nystagmus, uh, vertigo, dysdiagnosis, all of those things. PSP is your second one. Progressive supranuclear palsy. And the main thing they can't <coughs> do is if you get them to look at you but moving their head up and down, the same, it's the opposite of Dole's high reflex, where you're moving from side to side but keeping the focus on the same person. It's the same thing as with your progressive supranuclear nuclear palsy. They can't get that. They, they have va vertical gaze palsy. Uh, and you'll have the Parkinsonian symptoms as well. So that's the crunch line in that one if you ever see that in exam. Uh, cortico-basal degeneration, 
the crunch line is your uh, things like they won't be able to speak. They won't be able to speak because A, they can't form the words and B, they can't enunciate them. Uh, another thing is that they won't be able to plan. Uh, so a praxia, they won't be able to play a piano, for example, because it's a rehearsed movement. They won't be able to dr uh, ride a cycle. A pseudonososis, a uh, fancy word to just say, I can't close my eyes and feel and say that's a mouse. Uh, a stereo, stereo meant two sides. Gnosis, to know, can't do that. An alien limb, uh, fans of uh, Oliver Sacks will know much more about this. And then last one is Lewy body dementia. Classic if you've got Parkinsonian symptoms with any hallucinations, especially visual. You know it's Lewy body dementia until proven otherwise. Uh, lastly, your differentials for something like this, for a basal ganglia lesion, would be, again be the classical things, so metabolic, things like Wilson's disease, you've got uh, seroplasmin, copper uh, building up, biatrogenic, so some antipsychotics can do that, uh, metacropamide, some antiemetics that work centrally can do that. Uh, I don't know if you can have a farm uh, example written, but it'd be worth knowing where the antiemetics work. So when Dancentron works at a different place than cyclozine, then metoclopramide, and when you're having to prescribe it at 3 a.m. in the morning, or the patient is not doing well, you, get, you prescribe it, you go away in two hours, you get a bleep saying, they're now quite drowsy and vomiting and not doing that well. And you go, damn it, I've written a, a, an anti-emetic that's working in the wrong place to them. So it's worth spending a couple of minutes. On. Fine, lastly, infection. So uh, that can work anywhere. Next patient. So some of you might know my friend already. Uh, she's a 31-year-old who comes to A&E. Recurrent episodes, that's the key there. Recurrent episodes of weakness and falls. Shooting pains. That's a classic sign as well. It's so front-loaded that you can't miss, and that's the aim of the MCQs is for you to recognize everything that you have learned as telling you, yes, this is this case. Uh, lastly, decreased vision. So who wants to have a stab? Yeah? Nice. Yeah. Oh, they're all drowning now. You're doing well. Almost there. Come on. MS. Uh, this is the classic picture, relapsing, remitting. Much more common in women, twice as more as men. Uh, common in Caucasian individuals as well. Um, and uh, smoking Hathaway is, uh, is a classic example of a uh, patient population you'll get. Four different types, uh, multiple different names for people who want to write textbooks, but basically relapse and remitting is the one that will be the commonest one that you will see and is the easiest to pick up. You get something fancy called internuclear ophthalmoplegia. What is it? And the eye ones always take a bit of time because it there's a few of them and you get confused and you say, well, hang on, was that uh, rapid? You know, were, were you getting uh, uh, afferent pupillary defect? Oh no, that was nuclear ophthalmoplegia. So what's the problem here? Well, you've got something called, uh, it, it's the junction between two nuclei. So third nerve and sixth nerve. Of one third nerve of one eye meets the sixth nerve of the other by a track called the medial longitudinal fasciculus. That track gets broken, so your eye movements are not conjugate anymore. If you move them, they both move at the same time and they won't if this is hit. So what happens is that this is baseline, the top image there. You get a lesion, and your ipsilateral eye, you can't adduct. So you can't bring, if I've hit my right eye, I can't bring it in, but my left eye is wanting to pull it towards it, so when it's conjugating, it's going with a rapid flick in abduction, and that's the nystagmus on the contralateral eye, to try and pull the other one across with it. That's all it is. Classic names in terms of your investigations. Well, your MRI will show periventricular white matter which will be enhancing. Your contrast is gadolinium, the GD is just the contrast. But the gadolinium contrast will show enhancing white matter around the ventricles. LP, you'll get classical IgG oligoclonal bands. 
and you will get, you will do evoke potentials anywhere you do them. You do them in the muscle, the vision, the hearing. Always you'll get a lag. You'll get a delayed evoke potential. Basically, your action potentials will be slower to transmit. And why is that? The, well, the problem is in the myelin, the Schwann cells. What's helping you travel fast? Your nerve conduction. That's the, where the problem is. So that's why your potentials will be slower. If any one of you have had problems with your laptops where you've had a charger that sometimes works and then stops working, it's similar, it's a, not the same analogy because there the process is that the charger cable is not replacing itself every now and then. But that's what's happening with the relapsing remitting uh, sclerosis where you try and regenerate the myelin, it breaks down again because it, there's antibodies to it. You try and regenerate it again and it breaks down. Treatment as with degeneration, you give them MDT, you give them high dose prednisolone, and you give them monoclonal antibodies. Uh, Alantuzumab is against CD52, that's the only classic one you need to probably know, but some of that might be more pathology than you need to know for your MCQs. Um, and that's it. Things that make uh, it better are things like you being young, things like there being greater time between lesions. Um, Last couple of slides are for those who want to uh, get the maximum points. Uh, very minutiae, but things like uh, infection, your guillain barre what is it? You've heard of it, had lots of teaching on it, forgotten in half the time. I kept getting confused between brown saccard and guillain barre or if I am honest, between anything that was double barreled, because I had very little patience and that kept making me think, well, they all sound the same. But guillain barre if you want to keep it in your head, the simple concept is that it's a polyneuropathy that's autoimmune, and it usually happens after an infection. So especially if you've got someone who's got diarrhea, Campylobacter is your culprit. Campylobacter, a few days from then, you develop this uh, ascending polyneuropathy, and it's more proximal, and your worry is that they will stop breathing as the uh, neuropathy increases and goes up to your diaphragm, diaphragm and, and your respiratory muscles. So what you do on the ward day to day is give them uh, intravenous immunoglobulin to attack the uh, antibodies and at the same time you do daily forced vital capacities. You get spirometry daily to see if their uh, breathing muscles are not getting tired. And the last other one is, is this fancy distinction between myasthenia gravis and lambert Ethan myasthenic syndrome. One, you become better as you exercise more. The other, you become more tired as you exercise more. <coughs> and the reason's pretty straightforward. One is a problem in the presynaptic terminal, and the other is in the postsynaptic terminal. So it's just the concentrations of the receptors. What saturates the receptors? That's the only difference. Myasthenia gravis is a problem in the postsynaptic receptor. So the treatment then is that if you try and increase the amount of acetylcholine in there by blocking the esterase, by blocking the acetylcholine esterase, that's what edrophonium or pyridostigmine does. It's just fancy treatment words for the things that block the esterase. You basically increase the concentration of the acetylcholine and saturate the receptors with that rather than the antibodies. That's your myasthenia gravis. Your lambert ethan syndrome is the problem in the presynaptic terminal. So in this case, the more you'll exercise, the better you'll feel. And this one is associated with paraneoplastic things, especially small cell lung cancer. You'll see this in that. The last one that was important, I think, was acute confusional state. And we've gone back to what we started on this evening, a slide that just goes through a broad syndrome via etiology. Why are you confused today, this evening, in the middle of this lecture hall? Well. Most of it probably uh, wasn't well explained or didn't make sense, that's one thing. Other thing is that you could be hemorrhaging in your brain, that's another. You could have an infection that's brewing, that's the third. All of these reasons, like with anything else. So when you see your patient who's confused acutely, you run the same bloods, you do the same tests, and you ask someone senior. Okay, what have you learned today? Uh, bleeds, and you've recognized what their history and imaging means, and you can tell now a subdual from an <coughs> epidural from a subarachnoid. You've known what's meningitis versus meningism, which you'll get in bleeds as well, and recognizing the different types of CSF. Cord compression, it's an emergency use, so when you get your axon and you want to see the red flags, your 
incontinence, your uh, lack of anal tone, all those things. Degeneration and their whole spectrum. So Parkinson's, but it's all the Parkinson plus, uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, and then your practice of MCQs and your spot recognition. So the terms that you can bang, recognize and say, okay, I know what this is. Xanthrochromia, subarachnoid, um, intranuclear ophthalmopedia, MS, things like that. Thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any uh, suggestions, please, please let us know. Because most of us, uh, either if we haven't trained in Leeds or if we haven't known your curriculum, then it's a bit uh, more difficult. And we'd love to be able to help. So if there's anything that was good, anything that was bad, what we need to change, give us a shout. And give a big round to Countdown guys, because they've organized all of this. So.